2021 Canadian Open Mathematics Challenge Part C. Determine all points P, X, Y such that 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and P are vertices of a parallelogram. Okay, so we have a situation where they've given us already three points, right? 0, 0, uh, 1, 1, which is approximately there, right? 1, 1, and 1, 0. So this point right here. So this point, and this point, and this point. So a lot of this, I think, is just inspection, just by looking at this. We want a parallelogram. So one scenario is just to put the fourth point here. So the four point, fourth point would be 0, 1. And if that's the case, then we'd have a square. And a square is a parallelogram. I mean, it's one type. OK, so let's keep this going here. Uh, another way of doing this, we've got 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. I think the other way is to put the point here, which would be 0, negative 1, right? And if you did that and you connect the dots, again, it becomes a parallelogram. And then another way would be if we just first plot those three points to put the fourth point here which would be, I believe, 2, 1. And if you connect the dots, as you can see, it is also a parallelogram. So 0, 1, 0, negative 1, and 2, 1 would be all points that would make those four points uh, the vertices of a parallelogram. Two parallel lines intersect the horizontal parabola x is equal to y squared at four distinct points, 0, 0, 1, 1, 9, 3, and q. Determine the coordinates of all possible points q, x, y. So I think the first thing is just, just to draw a sketch of what this sort of looks like, and then we can talk about it. So if I just draw uh, x, y axis, and this is a ho horizontal parabola, so that means it's going to look something like this. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Where, of course, it passes through x, uh, 0, 0. So it passes through the origin. So And then, it, of course, it goes on forever. So x is equal to y squared. Where, of course, this is the x-axis, and that's the y-axis. OK, so they are telling me that you have four distinct points. So 0, 0 I've already labeled. That's the origin. And then 1, 1. Okay. So uh, I don't know, approximately here. Not drawn to scale, but you know, you guys get the point. 1, 1. And then 9, 3. So 9, 3. Oh boy. So of course, not drawn to scale, but you guys understand. 9, 9, 3, approximately here. And then Q. So Q is uh, somewhere. Okay, so let's first draw the parallel lines. Uh, so the first line, obviously, would be between those two points. And then the next parallel line would be through uh, 9, 3, but then it's going to be parallel, so it's got to be something like this. So, yeah, that's good enough. Okay, so that means that this guy right here, down here, is my Q. So that's my Q. And they're asking, what are the possible coordinates for Q? Okay. All right, so first thing, of course, we've got to figure out the slope of this line right here. Uh, this one right here. And that one. Well... We know the points here are 1, 1, and 0, 0. So that's easy to figure out the slope. It'd be rise over run, which is 1 minus 0, 1 minus 0, which is just 1. So the line, uh, this line, I'll just call it L1, I guess. That L1, the equation is y is equal to mx plus b, as all lines have. But m, we just figured out, was 1. So it's 1 times x plus b. And then to get b, we just substitute in one of the points. I'll just substitute in the origin, which is 0, 0. And when I do that, I get 0 is equal to 0 plus b. Therefore, b is 0. And therefore, the equation of that line is really just y equals x. Hmm, interesting. OK, no problem. 
And then now we'll concentrate on this line, which I will call L2. So L2, that one is parallel. So it has the same slope. So its slope is also 1. And therefore, its equation is again 1 times x plus b. But this b is going to be different this time because it, it, it doesn't have the exact same coordinates. OK, so to figure out b, we'll substitute in any of the points. Well, we only know one point, 9, 3. So 3 is equal to 9 plus b, and therefore b is equal to negative 6. So L2 has the equation y is equal to x minus 6. OK, so now we have to find the intersection of this line with our parabola, which is y is equal, x is equal to y squared. OK, so x is equal to y squared, so that means we substitute that in, y squared minus 6. And therefore, if you put everything on one side, you get y squared minus y minus 6. And I believe this factors very nicely y, y, 3, 2, minus plus. Yeah, minus plus. So that means y is equal to 3 or negative 2. OK, well, looking at this graph, q most likely has a y coordinate that's negative. So I'm going to choose the negative 2. So if y is negative 2, then x is y squared. So x would be negative 2 squared. So x is 4. So q is 4, negative 2. OK. Now, the scenario that I did just now is one scenario. It's only one scenario. There's two others, actually. And some people might actually miss that. Uh, and I'll write them down. And I will let you do them, because the process is uh, identical to what I did here. The second scenario is when L1 is through the points 0, 0 and 9, 3. And L2 is through the points 1, 1 and Q. So you would go through th pretty much the same process, but this time with you know different coordinates. And that, I'll give you the answer. When you figure out Q, you will get the answer for 2. And the process is identical, so I will let you do that because it's pretty very redundant. 3 is the, the third of the three scenarios, obviously, and that's the, when L1 is through 1, 1, and 9, 3. And L2 is between 0, 0, and Q. And when you do that, Q is the coordinates has the coordinate 16 4 so that's the complete solution and I'm certain that you will be able to do parts 2 and 3 on your own since part 1 has been done for you right here two parallel lines intersect the parabola x is equal to y squared at four distinct points uh, 0 0 1 1 a squared a and v hence here, a does not equal 0 or plus or minus 1 and is a real number. Determine the coordinates of all possible points v. The answer should be expressed in terms of a. Okay. So just like before, we're going to have three possible scenarios. Scenario 1, scenario 2, and scenario 3. The first is where an L1 goes through the points 0, 0, and 1, 1, and L2 goes through the points a squared a and v. And then scenario 2 is when L1 goes through the points 0, 0 and a squared a. And when L2 goes through 1, 1 and v. And then finally, the uh, third scenario is when you have L1 going through 0, 0 and v, and L2 going through 1, 1 and a squared a. And each of these scenarios should give us a different coordinate for v. OK, so let's start. And hopefully, we'll get the hang of this. OK, so it's very similar to before. The only difference is this time we have a instead of some number. OK, so l1, we find the slope. And that slope was 1 minus 0 over 1 minus 0, which is 1. So therefore, uh, L2, since it is uh, uh, parallel, it has the same slope. 
So its equation will be y is equal to mx plus b, but since m is 1, it'll be 1 times x plus b. Okay. And now we have to figure out b. We sub in a point on L2, and we'll sub in that point. So when a is equal to y, x is equal to a squared plus b. So therefore, b is a minus a squared. So therefore, the equation is y is equal to x plus a minus a squared. Okay? And we put this all on one side. Um, well, actually, before we put it all on one side, we have to find the intersection uh, of this line with the parabola, right? Which is right here. x is equal to y squared. Okay. Well, that's not, not a problem. We did that before. It just substituted in. So y is equal to x, but x is y squared plus a minus a squared. Okay, now we put it all on one side. I got a little ahead of myself. y squared minus y plus a minus a squared. And I think, hmm, I don't know if this factors. What should I do here? I'll put it all on, I put the a's on one side. So this will be a squared minus a. And this will be y squared minus y. So if I factor, it becomes a minus 1. And this becomes y times y minus 1 like that. So that means either y is equal to a or y is equal to 1 minus a. Yeah. Because if it's 1 minus a, it'll work. Yeah, 1 minus a. So therefore, my coordinates, it looks like, uh, for v, are, let's see here, x is y squared, right? So that means it's either uh, this is inadmissible because uh, the question states that a cannot be 0 or plus or minus 1. So if y is equal to a, a could be 0, and that's not allowed. So we can't use this guy so because x, uh, sorry, a is not equal to 0. So the only one we can use is this guy. So that means my coordinates x, y would be uh, y is 1 minus a, and then x is y squared, right? So that would be 1 minus a squared. x would be 1 minus a squared. And there you go. That's what they wanted. They wanted v in terms of a. Okay. So I'll do parts 2 and 3. Uh, they're pretty much the exact same, but we'll just go for it. Might as well. So same thing. This time L1, the slope is going to be uh, a minus 0 over a squared minus 0. So that looks like 1 over a. And therefore, the equation for L2 is y is equal to 1 over a times x plus b. Substitute in a point, and of course, the only point we have is 1, 1. So that would mean 1 is equal to 1 over a plus b. And therefore, b is going to be equal to 1 minus 1 over a. So my equation, therefore, would be y is equal to x 1 over a, so it would be basically x over a, plus 1 minus 1 over a. And that is basically identical uh, process to what we did before. OK. Now recall that, of course, x is equal to y squared is the intersection, uh, the parabola that this line will intersect with. So we substitute that in. So we get y is equal to y squared over a plus 1 minus 1 over a. OK. So when you, uh, let's see here, what can we do? Um, put everything. <laughs> if we multiply through by a, we get rid of the fraction. We'll get a y is equal to y squared plus a minus 1. And then we can put the y's on one side and the uh, a's on one side. So this will be 
let's see here. Uh, 1 minus a is equal to y squared minus a y. Factor out the y, we get y times y minus a is equal to 1 minus a. Okay, so that means that y is either equal to 1 or y is equal to a minus 1. Okay, so since uh, we have this uh, restriction that y or a cannot be equal to plus or minus 1, that means that y can only be a minus 1 in this case. Yeah. So that means our only coordinate for v this time well, th this was the previous one right here and this time we have uh, V is equal to X Y so Y I have set as a minus 1 and then X is Y squared so a minus 1 squared okay all right, that's pretty good. And now let's keep going on the same thing. By now you're an expert, so you should be able to do this on your own. Um, and I think you will, you should do it on your own. <laughs> so I'll just give you the answer. Uh, it's, it's exactly the same as this process. So using these coordinates this time. This one will give you uh, x, y coordinates as a plus one for y and a plus one squared for x and there you go so this is your homework here hm homework let mn be greater than or equal to 2 be positive integers each entry of mn grid contains a real number in the range negative 1 2 1 between negative 1 and 1 inclusively. The grid also has the property that the sum of the four entries in every 2 by 2 subgrid is equal to 0. A 2 by 2 subgrid is the intersection of two adjacent rows and two adjacent columns of the original grid. Let S be the sum of all of the entries in the grid. If M is 6, N is 6, explain why S is equal to 0. Okay, well we have this time a 6 by 6 grid so 6 by 6 so we will have 6 here and then we have 6 down like that and they're saying why is s equal to 0 here well what is s first of all it's the sum of all the entries right well they've told us already that every 2 by 2 grid is equal to 2 uh, sorry is equal to 0 so for example this is a 2 by 2 grid regardless of what we put in there its sum will be zero so if this was a and this was b and this was c and this was d a plus b plus c plus d is equal to zero okay similarly this two by two grid its sum is also zero that's zero this one this one this one this one this one and this one so all of those 2 by 2 grids have a sum of 0. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And therefore, if you add them all up, they would be 0. And therefore, that is why s is equal to 0. So you can explain that you have 9 2 by 2 subgrids, right? And each has a sum of 0 by definition you know in the question they even they tell you that and therefore s is nine times zero which is zero so that's pretty much all you need to do for part a okay part b part b says suppose m is three and is three and the elements of the grid are a b c d f g h i show that s plus e is equal to a plus i is equal to c plus g So based on this grid, 
we can tell that the total sum s is going to be the sum of all the entries which is a plus b plus c plus d plus e plus f plus g plus h plus i correct so therefore we can group these into two by two grids the first grid uh, that's sort of a two by two is this guy right here so I'll group those B plus C plus E plus F so I've taken care of this this E and F the other two by two grid is uh, well we have is going to be an overlap D E G F so D E G F this guy and so let me put that in brackets so D E G F D plus E plus G plus H sorry I think I said F before so it's D E G H and that one uh, I drew in the red now that takes care of this D G H but I put an extra E you see I have two E so I got to subtract one E because I've got to make these equal and then I, if I don't have A and I so I've got to put A and I out here okay well according to the definition each of those two by two grids has a sum of zero so this is zero and this is zero entirely based on what the question tells me in in the opening stem and then I've got this E plus I've got this I plus I've got this A so this basically is S plus E is equal to A plus I and that is the first part of what they wanted in a very similar way we can do the same thing but this time we can uh, let me draw it in another color uh, group as a b d e so a b d e and then uh, e f h i so e f h i those two grids hopefully you can follow what I did there so a b c that whole thing just like before but this time I'm grouping it into first A plus B plus D plus E which is A B D and E so I take care of those and then the yellow E F H I so E plus F plus H plus I so F H I and then I added two E's in here so I gotta subtract one and then what's remaining is C and G I believe yeah okay so just like before we know that this guy is zero and this guy is zero so that just leaves me with S is equal to minus E plus C plus G and therefore S plus E is equal to C plus G and that's the second part S plus E is equal to C plus G so that's it that's what they wanted you to figure out suppose M is 7 N is 7 determine the maximum possible value of S okay so we don't have to do a work of art here but we got to put in a 7 by 7 grid okay so 1 2 3 okay so that's 7 and then I've got to do another 7 partitions and there we go okay so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to look at the diagonals. So I'm going to label the diagonals and only the diagonals. So A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Okay. And then I'm going to partition this into two uh, four by four. So here's a first four by four. And the second four by four, we're going to overlap with that D but we'll take care of that later on okay so this is sort of the the setup now the three by three uh, squares uh, that we have from part B if you notice that's still up there from part B right s plus e is equal to a plus i is equal to c plus g right we had to prove that and we did so using that we can say that S is equal to A plus I minus E or C plus G minus E, right? I, all I did was put the E on the other side. And now, 
If you just look at this uh, diagram and compare it to our diagram, which in the first scenario is just this box right here, this two by two, just look at the letters, right? The orientation doesn't matter as long as you look at the diagonals. And this box, the diagonals are uh, A and I, and the middle is E. In this box, the diagonals are A and C, and the middle is B. So that basically would mean that this could also be written as A plus the other diagonal, which is C, minus the middle, which is B. So you see what I did there? I just compared. I'll do it again. Hopefully, it makes sense again that in this uh, box, the diagonals were C and G. Here's C and here's G, and E is the middle guy. And this box here, the diagonals are uh, this time uh, E and G, and the middle is F. So using that same sort of comparison, it would be uh, E plus the two diagonals, E plus G, minus the center one, which is F. So hopefully that makes sense, right? That's I just did a comparison. OK, so now each of those 4 by 4 squares, the ones that I drew, the red one and the green one over on the diagram, Here's the red one, right? And here's the green one. Can be partitioned into four two by two squares and therefore have a sum of zero. And that's entirely based on the definition of the question. So that means that this entire seven by seven, so therefore the seven by seven square, which is the whole square, has the following sum. And we can call it S for sum. We've got this yellow box here, right? Which is essentially A plus C minus B, right? From up here. I'm, I'm talking about the entire, so I guess we can put an entire sum just to avoid any confusion. And then we have this yellow box up here, and that we have concluded as E plus uh, G minus F and then the other the 4 by 4 boxes have a sum of 0 but we got to be careful because we counted the D twice so because we counted it twice we have to subtract it once alright so just make sure you you don't miss that so this entire sum now they're asking what is the maximum well we were told I think by now we've sort of forgotten about it that each of these entries can have a value between negative 1 and 1. So that's very important. Each of these entries can have a value between negative 1 and 1. So each entry is between negative 1 and 1. So therefore, if I put 1 for this, 1 for this, negative 1 for b, 1 for this, 1 for this, negative 1 for f, and negative 1 for d, it would give me my maximum, which in this case would be 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, which I believe is 7. And that is the maximum. Zin Tong plays a game of turning one six-digit si number into another. The numbers can have leading zeros, but cannot go over six digits or below six or below zero. He can only make the following moves any number of times in any order. R rotate the last digit to the start. For example, zero nine two three four seven becomes seven zero nine two three four. Or A add one zero zero one to the number. For example, seven zero nine two three four becomes seven ten two three five. Or subtract one zero one from the number. Show that it is possible to turn. 202122 two, two, two into 313233. Three, three. Okay. So 202122. Two, two, two. We've got to turn into this number. Okay. Using our rules, which are up here. Okay. So the first thing I'll do is A, which is essentially adding 1001. So that'll be 203123. Two, 
Then I will use R, which is a rotation. So the three comes out front, two, zero, three, one, two, like that. Then I will use A again, and that would make this number three, two, one, three, one, three. Then rotation, bring the three out front, three, two, one, three, one. Okay. Then A again, and that A would this time make this, uh, or adding, so three, 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 one, three, two. And then I think at this point, a whole bunch of rotations. So rotation once, so two, three, 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 one, three. Rotation again, three, two, three, 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 one. Rotation again, one, three, two, three, three, three. And I think one more rotation, then you get three, one, three, two, three, three. And therefore, yeah, we got it. That's what exactly what they have. So this is the, the I guess, the, the sequence of moves. Part B, show that turning 999999 into 000 can be done in eight moves. Okay, so same kind of story. So we start off with 999, 999. Okay, so what are what, what is my order this time? Uh, let's keep the definitions in the screen if I can. Yeah, okay, I can do that. So the first one I think I'll do is an S, which is subtract. So when you subtract, it'll brought, bring it down to 9989998. And then our rotation, so that will bring the 8 out front, 99899. And then an addition, which would be a 900900. And then a R, which is 090090. And then an R, which is 009009. And then an A, which is an addition, so 10010. Yeah. And then an R, which is a rotation, 0. Zero one zero zero one, and then a subtraction would take away that one zero zero one, and there you go. We got nine 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 into zero 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 zero, and eight moves: one two three four five six seven eight. Part C: Show that any multiple eleven remains a multiple of eleven after any sequence of moves. Let's say that number is n, and n, because it's a multiple of 11, is 11 times k. Well, uh, if you look at the rules, two of the rules involve the number 1001, which essentially is going to be either added or subtracted. Well, 1001 itself is a multiple of k. It's 91 times 11. It's a multiple of 11. So that means these moves... Uh, that involve A and S, which is adding or subtracting, will result in a multiple of 11, right? Will, will result in N remaining a multiple of 11, right? Because you either add or subtract a multiple of 11 from a number that is a multiple of 11, the result is a multiple of 11, right? You can try it out and see. So we took care of A and S, but there's one more move and that involves a rotation. The rotation, what happens there? So that's what we need to discuss. So this part is fine, but the rotation is really the R. That is what we need to talk about. We know that N is a six digit number. So let's say it's A1, A2, these are the digits, A3, A4, A5, and A6, okay? And then you bring out one of those divisibility rules, divisibility rules. Divisibility, many I's in this num uh, word here. For, for 11, the, the, the divisibility rule is that a number is divisible by 11, if the alternating sum is divisible by 11. So if 
the alternating sum. So in this case, a1 minus a2 plus a3 minus a4 plus a5 minus a6. That is what I really mean by alternating sum is divisible by 11. So this is a rule. Now with our r move, what we do basically is n becomes like this. The a6 comes out front and then everything is shifts uh, one place to the right, correct? Yeah. So this is what happens with the r move. Well, let's see, what is the alternating sum here? This now is a6 minus a1 plus a2 minus a3 plus a4 minus a5, okay? And this essentially is very similar to n. If you look at this and then look at this, right? If, let's say this was called s, this is negative s, right? Look at it. It's basically the same thing, just multiplied by negative 1. So if this is divisible by 11, right? Divisible by 11, then this is also divisible by 11, right? So there you go. So that means the R move would result in n remaining uh, a multiple of 11. So as long as you kind of knew this divisibility rule, you should be able to prove this with a few sentences. We call FC a good pair if the following three conditions are satisfied. F at x is equal to AO, A1, X, dot, 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 until AM, XM, where M is greater than or equal to 1, is a non-constant polynomial with integer coefficients. C is a real number that is not an integer, and FC is an integer. For example, both 6X, 1, 3, and 1 plus x to the power of 3, 5 to the power of 1 third are good pairs, but none of the following pairs are good. Let's see equal a half. Give an example of f such that fc is a good pair, but fc plus 1 is not. Okay. So first let's just try to explain what is it that they're talking about here. So why is this a good pair right here? Well, let's look at the definition. They're saying that you've got this f at x, right? And f at x has to be some polynomial, non-constant polynomial of this form. So does 6x qualify? Sure. It's a, a simple example, but it qualifies. Then the next criteria, c is a real number that is not an integer. So c in this case is 1 third. Is it a real number? Sure. It, it is an, also not an integer. And then f at c that has to be an integer. So in this case, it would be six, t uh, 6 times 1 third, and that, of course, is 2, and that is an integer. So that's why that qualifies as a good pair. And you can do the same thing with that, and you can also deduce that it fits all three criteria. So now they're saying c is a half. We've got to figure out some function. So I'm sure there's several, but there's one that I can give you, f at x, if it equals 2x to the power of third, plus x squared plus x. That would fulfill the three criteria. First criteria is that, is it a non-constant polynomial? Yes. Does it have integer coefficients? Yes. 2, 1, and 1. And it's non-constant, and it is of this form. So that's first criteria. Second criteria is that, is c a real number? Well, c is given in this case as a half. It is a real number and is not an integer. Okay, so that's uh, fulfilled. Now we have to figure out f at c, and f at c must be an integer. So that means we have 1 half to the power of 3 times 2 plus 1 half to the power of 2 plus 1 half. So that's 2 over 8 plus a quarter plus a half. And getting a common denominator of 8, that's 2 plus 2 plus 4. And that's 8 over 8, which is 1, which is an integer. So therefore, 
all three all three uh, criteria have been met that FC is a good pair but what about FC plus one we have to show that that is not a good pair okay well F remains the same that doesn't change we're using the same function 2x to the power of 3 plus x squared plus x and C this time well C is still fixed at a half but now C plus 1 would be 3 over 2 correct and then if you do 3 over 2 F at 3 over 2 we have to show that that would fail and that when you do the math you plug 3 half 3 over 2 into that it would give you 21 over 2 and 20 over 1 over 2 is obviously not an integer so therefore that fails this part of the rule and therefore f at c plus 1 is not a good pair okay moving right along the next part says let c equal root 2 give an example of f such that both both f at c and f at c plus 1 are good pairs okay so this time I will choose a function x squared minus 2 and I also will choose x minus 1 squared minus 2 so let's see what happens f at uh, c is, is fixed so c is fixed in, in this case as well as root 2 here okay so now I gotta figure out f at c and f at c plus one and then figure out if that makes them both good pairs. So f at c would it be f at root two. So this would be root two squared minus two. And this would be root two minus one squared minus two. So root two squared is two, two minus two is zero, so this becomes zero. And then and when you multiply it by this guy, it remains zero. And zero is an integer obviously so that makes this f c a good pair and where this is the function and c is root 2 now they also want you to prove that f c plus 1 is also a good pair well the same function but this time we have c plus 1 so we have root 2 plus 1 so it's f at root 2 plus 1 let's see what happens plug that in and we get root 2 plus 1 squared minus 2 and this one would be root 2 plus 1 minus 1 all squared minus 2 so this part here looks like uh, the ones cancel so root 2 squared is 2 2 minus 2 would be 0 and therefore once you multiply that by that that will also be 0 and since 0 is an integer again we have shown that this is also a good pair.